Um, thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to putting the self back in self, I'm sorry, putting the self back in self care, care wellness in the time of COVID-19. Um, if you're using Twitter or Instagram or other place for hashtags, please feel free to share um, with the hashtag vibes for help. If you're just joining us, the easiest way to access the control functions in Zoom is to exit the full screen mode. If you put your mouse at the upper part of the Zoom window, a drop down option, a drop down menu for view options will appear and select exit full screen. To access chat to communicate with the panelists and your fellow attendees, click on the chat icon. Please select all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu to share your questions and comments with everyone, including your fellow attendees. The default just goes to all panelists. We are providing closed captioning during this webinar and to access closed captioning, please select the closed caption icon. There are, I have two excellent colleagues on the phone or on the call webinar providing technical support. Um, you can, if you're running into trouble, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to, to ask for technical support. You also see them as a panelist with the names Tech Support and Tech Support Rachel. If you're having issues hearing me or the panelists, you may need to adjust the audio settings in Zoom. In the lower left-hand side of the Zoom window, there will be a pop-up menu <clears throat> that will allow you to just adjust your output and raise or lower the volume. And um, when I stop the introductions, I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and we will just, you'll just see the panelists. You'll have two viewing options at that point. One is speaker mode, which allows you to see the person who is speaking as the larger window. The other option is a gallery view, which provides the Brady Bunch style layout. You can switch back and forth per your preference. Okay, thank you everyone and welcome to today's National Network of Libraries of Medicine webinar. This session is being hosted by the Greater Midwest Region as part of its Kernel of Knowledge series. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Greater Mid <coughs> excuse me, Midwest Region, we're located at the University of Iowa, hence the Kernel of Corn in our Kernel of Knowledge series. We have an exciting presentation today and I wanna go ahead and get started. Just a few housekeeping items. Of course, you are all muted upon entry, so please use the chat box to ask questions and participate with the panelists. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in about a week for future viewing and reference. This webinar panel will provide one and a half continuing education credits from the Medical Library Association, and I will send the link for claiming that with the video recording in about a week. I want to introduce myself as today's host and facilitator. My name is Bobby Newman and I'm the Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist at the Greater Midwest Region. And I connect with public libraries across our 10 state region and across the country. I'm working from home like hopefully many of you are today. And um, as many of us are, I have a pet with me. I have a small dog who weighs about 10 pounds who is usually well behaved but really hates the neighborhood squirrels. So I would ask forgiveness if you hear her and um, similarly, I know some of our panelists are home with children um, and spouses and partners. So if you see people in the background, please be uh, forgiving of that as well. Before we begin today's webinar, I want to just um, share a little bit with you about who we are. For many of you may not be familiar with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Uh, the National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency, and many of you might be more familiar with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases right now, which is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. The National Library of Medicine is also an institute at NIH. It is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources, resources such as Medline Plus and PubMed. NNLM is the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, and it is an outreach program of the National Library of Medicine. NNLM is made up of eight geographical regions, and I'm from the greater Midwest region. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's panelists who have graciously offered their time and expertise during the COVID crisis. Amanda is the online learning librarian and faculty diversity fellow at Montgomery County Community College. Fobazi is the undergraduate success librarian at Rutgers Newark and 
more importantly, I think, creator of the concept of vocational awe. Eamon is the head of research and support out and outreach for Columbia University's Science, Engineering, and Social Sciences Libraries. Kay Trina is the researcher, facilitator, and leader, and the author of several studies on centering morale in libraries and the creator of the Renewal Workshop and Seminar. Jen Carson is the author of Get, Move, Get Your Community Moving, Physical, Physical Literacy Programs for All Ages, and Yoga and Meditation at the Library, a Practical Guide for Librarians. Madeline is at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Libraries, and she's the liaison to architecture, landscape, architecture, regional planning, and the sustainable food and farming. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the PowerPoint, and you'll now see the speaker view I was uh, talking about. Thank you all for being here and for giving um, your time today. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first question. Um, I am going to read the question and then I will call out the panelists uh, in the order we've talked about. The first question is, what is the status of your library? Where are staff working and are they being paid? And Amanda, have you go first for this question? Good morning and thank you for having me. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, in case anyone missed it on the little introduction. Um, my library is closed right now and all staff are being paid based off of our union contract. So whatever the union contract rate says, that's how they're being paid. They're all working from home and I think um, all the catalogers got computers to use at home. So they're all, we're all chilling out at home, trying to. Good, that's good to hear. Uh, Fobazi? <clears throat> Hello, everyone, um, and good afternoon. I'm on the East Coast uh, from Jersey, so it's noon uh, here. And um, our library is closed um, to everyone, and pretty much all of the staff and faculty are working from home. Our operations manager is expected to go in once a week to make sure, like, the building is I guess not on fire spontaneously um, and our access services department were given computers to do most of their work from home as well so thankfully um, thank Governor Murphy for specifically putting that libraries even on college campuses should be closed because that was the impetus um, to finally closing that's great. That's very great to hear. Eamon? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so thanks for this question. I think it's uh, important to kind of compare our experiences and I think everybody is not on the same page with library closures and the importance of them, especially um, library administrators and managers. So um, at Columbia University, the Library buildings are closed, um, which is great. <laughs> We're open for everything online, of course, as our libraries are, but um, there are no services in person, um, as it should be if we're taking our health and our patrons' health seriously. And we have two or three library staff who live nearby the campus uh, who check on the library buildings about once per week, every two weeks, to make sure things look okay and ensure there are no leaks or disasters, um, but the buildings have been closed to the public and most staff since uh, March 16th at this point. Um, and something I thought was uh, interesting about this that uh, maybe other folks experienced too, but the libraries were one of the last buildings uh, on our campus to close. So we closed after the gym, after the chapel, and I think that says something about how libraries are valued at our institution, but maybe not always in a good way, right? <laughs> because uh, I think we're valued for our space and as a kind of uh, social congregation area, but more for that space aspect than services. So there are a lot of conversations around who's considered an essential worker. And for some time, it wasn't clear that library workers weren't being put in that category. So um, thankfully, we were able to close with some advocacy from a university librarian. At this point, um, 
Our library system includes a bunch of different locations, but uh, librarians immediately started working remotely. Um, support staff were paid for the first two weeks of the library closure, and now they're working remotely and with pay as well. Um, and they're working closely with supervisors on work that can be done from home. We came up with the list of projects that they can do, things like that. And the student workers are being paid too, based on the average number of weekly hours they had um, up until the campus had closed. Um, so um, there's some reliable pay and um, the ability to maintain health. So those are all good things. That's great. Thank, thank you for sharing. Katrina? Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, having me here for this important conversation. I'm at the University of South Carolina system, and all the libraries in that system are closed. My particular library has been closed um, since March 16th. We're all, um, the librarians on our campus are faculty librarians, but um, all librarians on our campus are being paid. All the student workers are being paid, and our temporary workers are being paid as well. I believe that's because um, I've been advocating for people um, the whole time. And I think one of the things we're seeing is that when we consider the word advocacy and the, ab the word and the action of advocacy, we are constantly talking about the library as a concept and as a space. And those are great conversations to have. But we rarely talk about the people. People in the libraries is a later conversation that's been happening in the last two or three years. But when we all of a sudden start talking about people, when the crises are upon us, it is much harder to advocate for the people during the crisis. I believe that one of the reasons we are able to, number one, um, our um, people at the top, um, our president went ahead and just closed the libraries. But I do believe that if we had to have a personal conversation between the campus deans, it probably would have been okay because I've been advocating for people the whole time. But we never had to have the conversation, thankfully. Um, but I think we do need to have conversations about talking about people in the libraries when we're talking about libraries and advocating for people because that's what makes people run as we're seeing as we're working from home. So thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Great, great. I see all of us nodding while you're talking. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Jen. Hi, um, so I'm Jen Carson. I'm a public library director here in Woodstock, New Brunswick. I'm, uh, I run the L.P. Fisher Public Library, which is a small town library, um, but we're fairly busy. We have about 5,000, 6,000 people in our community, but we had 35,000 people through the doors last year. Um, so it's, it's, it's hopping. Um, we're definitely one of the largest community centers in our area, um, so people definitely come to us for more than just books, right? They're coming for all kinds of programs and services. Um, we've been closed. Our last day that we, that we were there in the building was March the 14th, um, and so we've been closed for, you know, six weeks now, and it's made a major impact on our community because it was one of the places that people really went to hang out. Um, we've had sort of an interesting approach. So um, we're one of the few places that I'm aware of in Canada, I'm not sure about in the States, um, where our entire province is a, uh, is a centralized system. So it's called the New Brunswick Public Library System. And we have 64 libraries that belong to the consortium and we all work as a unit. Um, so even though we may offer different services and have different strengths, like I have an archivist and a genealogist, on my team and other libraries don't have that and some of our libraries may be bigger or smaller um, we all report to one centralized office and so when we closed down our system said don't do anything go home we're paying all of you you know just go home and so that's what we did and some of us like I have children at home and and some of us don't and but everyone was paid um, everyone was sent home and we weren't given anything to do which at first was like sort of radically mind altering, <laughs> especially for those of us who have the tendency to be workaholics, like I need to help. Um, and so uh, we just had to kind of sit tight and wait. And of course my staff were like, what do we do? What's gonna happen? And I said, I know, I know it's really anxiety provoking. It is for me too, but I'm, I'm sure the government's coming up with a plan and we just have to trust them. And so it was really this amazing exercise in like handing over our autonomy to like a centralized government agency and being okay with whatever they come up with, came up with. And what they came up with was actually 
um, a, a brilliant plan, which at first, you know, I sort of balked at um, and was controversial, but it, te it, te it actually worked out really well. And so what they did is we didn't offer any online programming services at all. Unlike all the other uh, libraries that I'm seeing online offering all kinds of digital programming, we didn't do any of that because at the beginning of the crisis, um, our government was really worried that people needed a reliable source of government information and they also were afraid that um, people were going to get information overload and get, get inundated with too much programming and too many things to do and so much coming at them on social media. And so we basically just sat tight and there was one centralized message from our government that said, you know, if you need information about, you know, being sick or accessing services or whatever, go to this website. And everything from our government came from that website. And our libraries supported that. And then after a while, um, you know, two or three weeks of just pushing the safety message, which is pretty much all we were doing, safety and medical information and all that sort of stuff. Then they started slowly from provincial office rolling out, we're, we're a bilingual province, so French and English, um, bilingual services messages on our Facebook feed of like, okay, we've ramped up our um, online offerings of audiobooks and um, eBooks. And so here's the link you go to to get those. Here's how you get a library card if you don't already have one. And we were just like inundated with people requesting library cards, but that all went through provincial office. So we didn't have to do anything. Um, those of us that were at home, we just stayed here and we sat tight. Some people were asked if they were willing to be deployed to different departments or for different services. And so I had to survey my staff and ask them what they were willing to do, if they had me previous medical training, call center training, things like that. And so some people were deployed and sent to Service New Brunswick or other places, um, the Red Cross, to work if they wanted to, but no one had to, and it was completely voluntary. Everyone was paid regardless, and there was no um, penalty for saying no, right? You, it wasn't going to reflect badly upon you in your job. And so that's how we rolled things out in New Brunswick. And right now I have a conference call in about an hour <clears throat> to find out what our plan is to start going back. But again, they've been very methodical. I got an email last night with an Excel spreadsheet and I'm supposed to survey my staff and ask them when do they feel comfortable going back to work? What locations are they willing to work at? If they don't feel comfortable, what things are they comfortable doing at home? What sort of technology do they have at home? And so it's been a very methodical approach and safety has been taken as the number one priority. The only person going into the building is me. I go in once, twice a week, get the mail, check to make sure, you know, the book drop is locked so no one can bring back books anyway, but make sure people just haven't dropped them off. Our community has been amazing. There hasn't been a single thing left outside. Um, so just check on the building and, you know, pay the bills and do that stuff. But otherwise, no one else has been in the building, not even a janitor. It's just me going in and out. So that's what we've done here in New Brunswick in Canada. Um, and it's worked really well for us. Probably, you know, some people would have liked to see more services coming out of um, what we were offering, but our, our government put the safety of the staff and the patrons first, and I really applaud them for doing that. That's great, thank you, Jen. And Madeline. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I'm really um, also seeing that there's 99 chats popping up at the bottom of my screen. And I really wish I could hear all of your stories because I can see that this question has, has uh, provoked a lot of uh, feelings. And, and um, I can't wait to go back and, and learn more about what you're all going through. Um, our library closed pretty swiftly on March 16th. I'm at the Du Bois Library, which is part of the UMass Amherst Library. So I'm in Western Massachusetts. It's a very large public institution, about 30,000 students, undergrad and graduate. And everybody is on the payroll at this point, except our student workers have been let go. And that's been really heartbreaking. And I'll give a shout out to one of our librarians named Annette Vadne, who took it upon herself to um, do a fundraiser and managed to raise $5,000 for our students. It's not a whole lot, but it was really um, an amazing feat that she just spearheaded on her own. And um, anyone that donated got to, uh, she did a live feed of um, 
she has purple hair and she shaved it off. That was sort of the draw to like bring people in to, to uh, donate money. So that's not the way it should work, but it was a small stopgap measure. And um, we had people doing interlibrary loan until pretty recently. And then that also was stopped for safety reasons. So we do have people going in to check mail and um, check on the building. But other than that, everybody is so far still on payroll. Great, thank you for sharing, Madeline. Okay, the first question, or I guess the second question um, for the panelists is, what is your background related to self-care? What does self-care mean to you and why is self-care important? Which I know is a lot for five minutes. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with Katrina for this one. Okay, so for me, <clears throat> self-care really for me begins with self-preservation. I think they should be done in tandem, but we often talk about self-care. For me, I think that um, self-care is stopping achievement for a little bit, stopping and for academics. So I'm an academic librarian. I'm on tenure track. And so for me, that means I really am in comparison with my, I mean, um, competition with myself. But tenure track often places you in competition, false competition with others. So for me, um, that means in the words of three-year-old Augusta Hunley, Worry about yourself, mind your business um, for me and focus on what brings me happiness and joy. It took me a while to get there. Um, but also self-preservation is, is, is tandem with that. And I think we often forget it. So for me, self-care self is engaging in self-preservation. And self-preservation, we talk about low morale. Low morale is um, repeated, protracted exposure to workplace abuse and neglect. Um, and so we often do not have the set of skills and knowledge in a moment when we are being abused and neglected. So self-preservation are the set of skills, tools, knowledge that you use in a moment when you recognize, as soon as you recognize, whenever that may be, um, that you're being abused and neglected by someone above you, hand them to you, or a direct report. It really doesn't matter. Someone outside the library, a first responder for those of us who might work with um, in the public library. Um, this happens at all. This, I've seen this happen in all libraries so far. So self-preservation is things are things like I engage in assertive communication. I engage in ways to say no. Um, and I work through the discomfort of saying no, because the longer discomfort is not saying no. I work with boundaries. So I figure out what they are and they move and change depending on whom I'm speaking to. But the boundary will always center what I need and my mental health. So the and so just those are three things for me. Self-preservation, including those tools of boundaries, assertive communication. Um, and I don't compete with anybody else. I try not to. Um, Theodore Roosevelt says that comparison is the thief of joy. While you can use a, a tool to compare data and things like that, I do not compare myself to what other people are doing. It's been a game changer for me, especially as an academic librarian and as a woman of color working in academia in the South, in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah, very important points. Um, Eamon? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think it looks like something different for everybody. Katrina made important points about that connection to self-preservation, right? Um, in terms of what it means to me, it's just really trying to ensure that I have whatever balance between work and the rest of my life feels right at that particular time, right? So um, some days or weeks it may be that work is more dominant and so I'll make an effort to try and stop work on time or say no to opportunities I know I won't be able to give enough attention to, right? I'm just trying to tamper down on things a little bit um, to give myself the time I need for everything else um and you know it's worth mentioning like self-care looks different for everybody in terms of actual practices so for me in like the last month it's like as simple as like getting takeout for dinner once a week when i can't bear to do any more dishes right or it's like binge watching some more tv so um it's also meant though checking in on like family and friends more often and um, connecting with them makes me feel more centered, um, a little more like can 
realize priorities in life instead of getting wrapped up in work. So um, really the key is like it's meaningful, enjoyable, and there's no right or wrong way to do that. But I think to touch on the second aspect of that question though, um, as to why it's important, um, I think it's really because we are important, right? Our lives and our health are important. So um, taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of other people, that's important, right? Um, and when we're physically isolated from each other, um, for those of us who are lucky enough to continue to have work, uh, it's easy to overdo it. And that has this, um, physical health consequences, mental health consequences. Um, and there's, um, let's see if I can remember this. There's a saying on Twitter that's like, you're not working from home, right? You're working at, you're at home during a crisis trying to work. That's the actual situation we find ourselves in. Um, so we're home during a crisis, trying to do everything else. Um, so it's easy to think that we're not doing right. Like, why am I not able to keep up with all this email? And what should I be doing? Why am I not doing this as much as everybody else seems to be accomplishing? You know, why am I not doing a sour to a starter too, right? Um, but those are all really, like Katrina says, you you have to focus on yourself and what's meaningful to you and not worry about um, those sorts of external pieces too. So um, I think the answer really to that is we have to refuse overworking um, and it's easy to agree that we should, you know, not be working long hours, but we have to put those expectations and actual practices into place and give each other slack um, and benefit of the doubt. Um, so we're all going through difficult things. Um, and just kind of important to keep that in mind and going forward. That's great. Thank you very much. Amanda. Hello again. So um, I'm just going to read this Audre Lorde quote because I always read it because it's so important, right? So caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation and it is an act of political warfare. Um, caring for yourself is the most important thing you can ever do. If you don't care for yourself, you cannot take care of everything else. Um, I'm gonna say this as nicely as I can. The library will be there. You may not be. <laughs> so make sure that everything that you're doing, especially right now, is focused on your own care, right? So for me, that means in this moment, part of my self-care is talking with all of you, right? Like I get to see other people who are not my parents for a couple hours, right? Um, I get to decompress for a second, not worry so much about work, right? And not even really think about work, okay? Um, maybe tomorrow it will be just practicing yoga for an extra 10 minutes. Um, I think I just try to take it day by day based off my needs in that moment. So that's mindful practice, right? That goes back to just taking it one moment at a time, not extending yourself too far to think about the future. And I think for right now, that might be the best thing you can do or that we all can do because this pandemic is just too big. It's too big to wrap your head around working from home. Some of us had no time to prepare. It was the governor said, you got to get out, you got to get out, you're closed, right? And I think we need to acknowledge that, that we had no time to prepare. We're not really doing library work right now. We're, we're doing triage library work, right? So we're trying to just con contain it until this thing is over. Um, so think about, in, in that sense, you're really not going to be able to do as much as you want to do. And there will be a point where you can't do anything anymore. So once that point comes, hopefully you have been taking care of yourself well enough that you're not like, I have nothing to do. What am I going to do? Who am I going to help? The person that you need to help is yourself. Um, and if you have learned nothing from COVID-19 is that if you don't take care of yourself, you will infect everyone else with this nonsense, right? of not taking care of yourself, of putting everyone else first for a, for a job that doesn't really care about your health in the first place. So my, my suggestion um, for everyone and always for myself is to make sure that my needs are met first and then I can worry about everything else. 
Great, thank you, Amanda. Uh, Madeline. Oh, I love hearing everybody's stories. I got caught up, I forgot I was on a webinar. But no, I'm here. Um, I'm a very practice-oriented person. Um, and I'm finding that the time away from like the usual hustle and bustle of the work, I've really been able to deepen my practice. Um, some of them are already in place. Um, I wake up every morning, I say a Hebrew prayer that is basically like just acknowledging, here I am, it's another day, what a gift. And then I very explicitly in my mind name three things I'm grateful for. So that is how I start every morning. And without the alarm clock blaring and having to get my son on the bus and make the lunch, and it's like, wow, I can really, really tend to that more. And it's really feeding me. And then I creep into my home office and I do a half hour sit on my cushion. And at the end, I, well, this is personal, but I'll share. I just, um, I think of all the, the people I know that are pregnant right now with babies coming into the world. And I have a little list of them and I visualize all the power that the creation and, and send health and, and well wishes to those growing children. I blow out my candle and the little smoke goes out into the universe. So I hope that doesn't sound too flaky for a webinar with 500 people. So thank you for a little glimpse of my um, inner life. And then I start my day. And I do that every day and I look forward to it. And that helps me feel grounded. And why I also think it's important is it makes me a better parent, a better partner. I think my work flows more easily with those kind of practices in place. And I like um, Amanda was saying about infecting other people. I, I also think of it that way, but the reverse, which is building our collective immune system. So the stronger that each of us can be, and if you could share it, you know, we're energy bodies. So the way we respond and talk, whether it's face-to-face -face or emails, you know, that all has like energetic connections. So being as present as possible, noticing my own window of tolerance, which if you're familiar with this idea, um, it was coined by uh, Dr. Daniel Siegel. We are in a sort of window of, um, you know, waves of feeling is how I feel every day, you know, especially these days. And then if you're very stressed, you're hyper aroused. And if you're below the window, you're hypo aroused, you're, you're sort of, I feel numb and underwater. Like, okay, what do I need in this moment or this moment to like return to a more, you know, even flow of the up and down? So I pay attention to that. And I think if we talk about these things and share practices with people that are open to them, like we're building our collective immune system and that feels particularly critical these days. And that's me, check. Thank you, Madeline. Okay, uh, Jen. Uh Okay, so you guys all have such wonderful things to say. I was having such a fun time listening to you, like Madeline said. Um, Amanda, I had written down the same um, Audre Lorde quote to share about, um, yeah, self-care being a radical act of, like, political resistance, right? Like, um, I, I think in a past webinar, possibly with you, Bobby, um, I had talked about before I joined my library system, we didn't close for snow days because one of the people higher up the system just was the kind of person who would drive in anything. And so they felt like, well, I'll drive in it. Everyone should drive in it. And so when I joined our library system five or six years ago, I, I only live a two block walk to the library. So it didn't affect me at all. But I have staff members that drive half an hour, an hour to get here. And I like absolutely put my foot down about it and was like, no, I don't care if like some people can get here. If we can't all get here, we're not opening. If it puts one person's life at risk, we're closed. Like, and I had to really advocate for that. And like I said, I'm in a library system with a, uh, the region I'm in has 12 libraries, six French and six English. And then we belong to a larger consortium of 64 libraries. And I had to advocate for that all 12 of us 
if one of us was closed, we could all close depending on, you know, the severity of the area. And, but the amazing thing was, is that other library directors contacted me after that and said, because you stood up to them and said it was important, now we all get to do it. Thank you for standing up. And so sometimes it just takes that one person to be a big mouth and to put a firm boundary in place and be like, no, I am not taking that. And then everybody else who was feeling the same way, but was maybe afraid to say it, um, you know, then they feel a solidarity with that. And it's not so scary. And they can also see like, oh, well, she didn't lose her job over it. Maybe I won't lose my job over it, too. Um, and so that was, that's really important. I mean, I've been very lucky in our library system to not have had to advocate for my staff being off. Um, but I can, I can tell you I would have if, if it had come to that, for sure. Um, and then touching on what Madeline said, um, I, I have a similar sort of practice. Um, I don't have the Jewish aspect of it, but um, I've been a meditation and yoga instructor and practitioner for 20 years now. And uh, that's an essential part of my day. Um, and I try to treat myself right now like a child um, in the sense that like, I feel very vulnerable and fragile, but children are also incredibly resilient. Um, and so when I get up in the morning, I care for my children, but I also care for myself in the same way. Um, and so I think like, okay, well, we all have to have breakfast and we all have to get dressed and what do we, okay, so the children need to work on this while I work on that. And I like structure my day. So we have these little tiny plans and we have a little snack break and then we do a little something else and then we have our lunch break and then we do something else and then we read a story together. And I do it not just for them to help them have some structure to their day, but also for me and my own survival, because it's like we have these little you know, hour long increments, like a preschool of like, okay, it's, you know, bubble time, and we're gonna go play with bubbles and and or, okay, mommy needs to make a phone call. So we get to watch Sesame Street or whatever. And it's like these little moments of joy in the day. And um, a therapist, I, I have a tendency to be a workaholic, unfortunately, um, though I've worked, I've worked very hard to have more fun. Um, and a, a therapist said to me once, how are you enjoying your children? And it like crashed me upside the head because I was like, what, what, do you, what do you mean? How am I enjoying my children? And she was like, well, how are you enjoying them right now? And I was like, well, I love them. And she's like, that's not what I asked you. Are you enjoying their presence? And I was like, oh, yeah, probably not too much. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm really like I need to play more and she, that was the point she was trying to make like Jen you know you you have and I was, she's like what do you do for fun I was like well I teach yoga and I do jujitsu and I run and she's like that sounds like a lot of work and I was like oh yeah I do I and I noticed I started noticing how everything that I do becomes a job because that's I, I'm caught up in that productivity culture that we have in North America where I feel like my very value is defined by what I'm able to produce or what I can get done in a day. And it's taken me two decades of like working really hard, work, here's that word again, working, of being okay with the fact that I have value just as I am. And all of you have value just as you are. And so that's my goal, my goal when I wake up every day is how can I enjoy my day? How can I enjoy the people in my house right now or the chickens in my living room or the weather today, even if it's not so nice or the dishes? How can I just wash the dishes in a way that makes me not hate dishes and actually try to find some enjoyment out of it? And so that is my continual practice of mindfulness is like, how can I enjoy my life as opposed to feeling like I'm just an ox pushing a cart along, right? And so I think that's been a huge eye opener for me in the self care world is trying to um, get out of that productivity mindset and into a value mindset of just enjoying my life. Cause that's what my life is actually here for to be enjoyed and experienced, not to, you know, achieve some sort of goal. So when I get to the end of it, you know, it's, it has a big list on my tombstone with my resume of all the things I completed, like who cares? Um, and so for those of you that are looking for resources, if you want some, there's a bunch of free stuff on my website and I'll put it in the chat. 
um, and they're in French and English and I've done a bunch of like self-care tips of things that you can do at home. So that's all free and I'll stick it up there for you guys. But that's what I've been doing for self-care is not trying to beat myself up so much about not getting stuff done. Great, Jen. Thank you. And Fabazi. Uh, <clears throat> again, hello, everyone. So in terms, I'm coming at it from a slightly different standpoint in that um, I'm a disabled woman and that my disability is exacerbated by stress and weather and um, basically extreme changes. So obviously this time is a very fun time for me. <laughs> um, but the sort of irony is, is that in many ways, this is the healthiest I have been um, prior to um, this all happening, I had been working very hard to try and get more than one day to work from home a week. Um, at my at Rutgers, we're not allowed to work from home. We have one research day a week um, in which we can we basically have to use it to produce something. And so um, despite my reasonable accommodations, uh, in, I was still having trouble getting at least one extra day a week to be able to work from home um, because I had found that in many cases, the act of getting to work was so stressful on my body that the rest of the day was spent like recuperating so that I could do it all over again the next day. And so, um, as I mentioned before, Rutgers was still open as a library until Governor Murphy shut the libraries on college campuses down. Like it specifically had to say that in order for Rutgers to close the libraries. But I had basically given my library an ultimatum. I sent an email to my supervisor and all the fat and CC'd all the faculty and said, um, this was March 13th, I think. Um, I was like, today's my last day in the office. This, I am severely immunocompromised. Whether I'm working from home from now on or going on FMLA, you can choose, but I am not coming back into this office until something has changed. Um, and like Jen, I heard from other people saying like, thank you so much for like saying that because it helped me advocate to my supervisor that I would also immunocompromised um, because at that point, Rutgers was still open to everyone. Nah. And the, the steps they took to close was first they closed just to the public. So students, staff, faculty, anyone affiliated with Rutgers, were, we were still open, um, which besides the uncomfortable, classist, racist, all this issues with closing to the community while staying open to those affiliated with Rutgers was also impractical seeing as the virus doesn't care what your affiliation is. Um, and the closest we had gotten to closing, and this was March 20 something before Governor Murphy sent out the executive order was to run through a skeleton crew, which was one IT person, one security officer, and one access services person who would rotate. Um, so I guess that all the access services department would have gotten sick since they're rotating. Again, it was clearly just like some sort of stopgap measure because they refused to actually close. Um, and so when, even though I was working from home since March 13th, Rutgers didn't close until almost the end of March. Um, and so the fact that I'm now getting to work from home every day means that I can actually set a schedule that is more conducive to the way my body works. And so I can, instead of using all of that energy and time to get to work 
and therefore having to recuperate from the actual commute to work, I can actually just start working when I feel able to and take breaks when I'm able to. And that has been so much better for my body. And, you know, the disability community has found it very ironic, right? In that so often, all of these accommodations that we have to ask for that are reasonable accommodations are seen as not reasonable until something like this happens where it affects everyone, not just the disabled. And then suddenly, oh, everyone can work from home. Suddenly, oh, yes, flexible schedules are something you can do. And so it's really unfortunate that it took a global pandemic for me to actually not get judged for the way that I need to work. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, obviously the stress and sort of existential questions um, can be a lot for the psyche and for the physical body, but in many ways, um, the ability to work from home and make flexible schedules has been a godsend um, to my health and wellness. And so I think that it, it leads into why it's so important. As we've all been saying, right, the library at the end of the day is just a building, you know, if I were to, God forbid, um, die tomorrow, right? I'm sh the administration would be like, oh, great, salary savings, because, you know, the state is going through this massive deficit due to all of the things that are going on, right? Like that, they, ALA might give me a nice posthumous medal, like, oh, she died in the line of service and move on, right? That there's nothing really that would change in the day-to-day -day for the library as a building if I was no longer there. And it's the reason why vocational on deconstructing it is so important to me. Like, it doesn't matter how much I love my job and love the work that I'm doing, my body, my disabled body cannot reach the level of productivity that the library as a concept, as an entity wants from me. Um, and so I think that it's important to just remember that at the end of the day, the library as a building, the library as an entity will keep on running whether you are there or not. And so if that's the case, the most important thing is to take care of yourself, to take care of your body, of your spirit, of, you know, staying connected to those around you and making sure that you are fine. And that, you know, it's not even just about work-life balance, but really work-life separation, you know, to make sure that, yes, you're doing work in whatever capacity that might be, but separating, which is especially hard now that it's a fully online environment, right? And it may be that our supervisors and administrators in general are trying to just replicate every offline interaction into a um, face-to-face online interaction, which is not the way to do it. Um, my uh, my wife uh, is a communication scholar, and she just did a webinar on basically keeping the social and social distancing, how to make sure you're still connected to your community and to yourself. And so I'm lucky to have, we both remind ourselves of it because we both do tend to be workaholics. <laughs> and so remind ourselves like, let's have you know separation like sure that email may see may be sent with high importance but i mean we're academics the building's not on fire 
we're fine. They'll be fine. Everyone will be fine if we can just actually take a lunch break, which can be really hard. I remember I have to schedule, even when I was working in the building, I had to schedule every single day in my calendar a lunch break because I found that if I didn't, I would just either work through lunch or I would take a short lunch break or in between. And uh, prior to working in academic libraries, I was a school librarian. And I learned from them, which I still take today, if you don't use it, when it comes time to the unions relitigating of everything, they say, well, you've been working through your lunch break, so you clearly don't use it, so you don't need it. And so I think that in academia, we tend to forget that sort of um, use it or lose it mindset because the relitigating of union stuff doesn't happen as often as it does in school. Um, but, you know, when we're having four or five Zoom meetings a day, it can be very easy to not actually stop and have an hour lunch break or even a 30 minute lunch break. And so it's definitely even more important in this online environment where the day could end up if you're not careful, being 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. to actually put breaks within your day and um, take the time for yourself. So that is definitely why it's important, not just for me, but for everyone. Great, thank you. Lots of important points. Thank you everyone for sharing. I really appreciate everyone's thoughts and my enthusiastic nodding. <laughs> um, also want to point out if you've seen me coughing, I've had this cough for going on four years. Uh, so nothing I believe related to the current situation. All right, so our next question is, um, what advice do you have for overcoming challenges related to creating or recreating a work-life balance that can be done for free, you know, at no cost remotely? And we're gonna start with uh, Jen for this question. Thanks, Bobby. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, I had to really kind of like remake my neural pathways in my brain to understand that there is no such thing as a work-life balance. Um, it's all life. Uh, you, you are just living and you need to be present for it. And sometimes um, we are working while we're living and sometimes we're doing other things that we don't call work. Um, but for me, it's, it's, I'm going to tell you a little Zen story. Okay. I like parables. Um, so there's this great little Zen story about this Zen master who's walking in the woods with his, um, monks and they're just walking along and they run into another Zen master and his monks and the monks start arguing with each other um, boasting about their Zen masters and saying well my Zen master can levitate and my Zen master can read minds and my Zen master can do this and sort of showing off his productivity and this is coming from one the one side and then the other Zen masters followers said oh well, that's all well and good. That's quite amazing. You must be very proud of him. But do you know what our Zen master can do? And they're like, what, what? And he's like, they're like, well, when he eats, he eats. And when he sleeps, he sleeps. And when he walks, he walks. And they were like, whoa. And they just, they, they deferred. They defer, they, he was the ultimate Zen master, right? Because that's the hardest thing to do is to just be present for your life. And, you know, those of us that practice meditation, um, we can say like, that's why hardly anyone meditates or tries it and gives up because it's so hard. And the idea is that you don't have to do nothing um, in your mind because I've talked about this in webinars before. Your mind is designed to problem solve, right? Just like your lungs are supposed to breathe and your heart is supposed to beat, your mind is supposed to look and scan the horizon, trying to find danger and then try and solve problems and work yourself out of situations. That's what your mind's designed to do. And so when we sit down and try to meditate, 
and try to calm our mind and have no thoughts. And then when we can't do it, we feel like we failed. And then that's just another thing on our list where we're like, screw it, I suck at this. You don't suck at it. You're still a good person if you think all the time, okay? And so the practice is watching yourself. It's standing back and realizing that you're not those thoughts you're having any more than you are the beats of your heart or the breaths that you take. And so something that I wanted to, to mention briefly is that anybody who's trying to meditate or have more mindfulness right now, maybe you've been doing some mindful breathing exercises and maybe that's not working for you right now because we're in the middle of a respiratory pandemic. And so thinking about your breath and trying to control your breath when you're scared that you might get sick or you might have you know, some worries that you could have the pandemic or anything like that, sometimes that's not the best way to approach it. And so you, know, you can have a really good um, experience of mindfulness and not think about your breathing and you can just sit and maybe you just count. Maybe you don't wanna do like a mindfulness breathing exercise where you focus on breathing. Maybe you could focus on counting. Um, and you just close your eyes and you count to 10 and then maybe you count back down. So there's all kinds of meditation um, apps out there and there's stuff on my website and there's lots of videos. Um, there's great meditation teachers, but if you're struggling um, with your nervous system right now, thinking too much about breathing and that's making you panic for those of you with anxiety and panic disorders sometimes meditation isn't always helpful because it makes you more panicky because one you feel like you're failing because you're still thinking and two you're thinking about your breath and oh my god you're trying to follow that breath and it's scary and so for those of you that are struggling with that I'm gonna suggest trying yoga or trying some other experience that brings you into your body but where you don't have to sit still because some of us are really like this inside and pent up. And so it's trying to sit still on a meditation cushion and focus on our breath is like, like a recipe for a panic attack. So instead, I'm going to suggest maybe trying some really easy, gentle yoga movements. Um, find some nice gentle yoga classes online. Again, you can find free ones on my website. Um, and just try those out and see if you can get yourself into your body and out of your head. And, and recognize when you're, like Madeline mentioned, when you're over-functioning or when you're under-functioning. Brené Brown has a really good talk about that. Um, and so if you notice you're trying to spin 27 plates at the same time, you're over-functioning. And when you feel that numb, like heaviness, where you feel like you can't get anything done, you're probably under-functioning. And trying to bring yourself back to some sort of equilibrium but recognizing that it's okay if you're up here and it's okay if you're down here because we're in crisis, right? And so your natural reaction or your maladaptive coping mechanisms are gonna come out right now. And that's totally okay because you're a wonderful human being and you have stuff to deal with just like the rest of us, okay? We're all experiencing that sort of stuff. So that's my suggestion to everyone about work-life balance is forget about it. Just live your life, and when you eat, eat, and when you sleep, sleep, and try to just be present for your life and see how that goes. And uh, you know, try some meditation. If it's not for you, it's okay. Try some yoga, try some other stuff to bring yourself into connection with your mind and your body. I have to peace out because I've got a call to do. I'm sorry, but it was so wonderful being here with you guys. Thank you, Jen. Okay, um, got some great advice. Um, Madeline, you're up. Yes, um, a lot of what Jen said was really resonating. She might have called it a trauma-informed approach to meditating. So there's a lot of literature out there. So right, whatever's not comfortable, you don't have to do that. And just to follow on a little bit with some more explicit practices, sometimes I stand up on my meditation mat and just stand and breathe and um, move around, try different things. And, and also, um, I think, um, you know, just like the simplicity of life is really speaking to, to me right now, talking about free things. I think of them like writing letters, which I've always been kind of like a stationary nut. I'm like, you know, get really excited when I go to Staples and see all those 
post-its and but I love note cards and I have so many and I've just I used to hoard them like oh this one's so special it has to be for just the right time and I'm like Psh, just like sending them everywhere to everyone that I love and plus we might want to support our U.S. Postal Service which is under attack which really pisses me off but that's another story um so yes using stamps and um I I do love to meditate I, I I appreciate the challenge of it. It feels very subversive to me that in the face of all that's expected of us and, and our culture, just like, guess what I'm going to do? Nothing. I'm just going to sit and notice and be. And it really does feel like a radical act. And I know there's tons of apps out there and I think they're great. I personally feel like it's why I used to love to swim a lot. I don't really need anything. It's just me. I just need maybe a bathing suit and some water. Like I, I really like the distillation of things. So I guess it feeds into Jen's story about the, the monks and just really like getting to like the core and really like picking the moments to just expand into spaces that we didn't previously had if we're lucky enough right now to have some peace and quiet to try to do that inside of. So that's my piece check thank you madeline um Fobazi, have you next uh, so as i said before right um it can sometimes be hard if your supervisors or administrators are trying to recreate every um experience in a face-to-face -face manner, right? For example, something that would, in the building, probably be just be like a passing comment in the hallway, being like, oh, hey, can you like do this or this? And yeah, and you just sort of keep it moving, and now it has to be a full hour Zoom meeting. Um, and so I definitely say, if possible, obviously in not all situations, if possible, um, creating boundaries for yourself and for your time, especially when it comes to the face-to-face -face aspect of interacting, um, saying, uh, hey, um, I don't have time for a full Zoom meeting right now. Um, can this be an email chain instead or can we do this over the phone or, you know, whatever, giving alternatives to having the face-to-face -face interaction. And, you know, not even necessarily worrying about what your excuse should be for not wanting to do a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, like my partner, right, uh, she's also an academic. And so her busy days are Thursdays. She's basically in a face-to-face -face meeting from 10.30 to 3.30. So I don't do any meetings on Thursdays. Um, if, and I don't think I need to tell anyone why I'm not available on Thursdays to do a face-to-face -face meeting. It's my life, right? If, I, if it's in the calendar, it's blocked out. Like it says busy. You don't need to know why I'm busy, what I'm doing, as long as I can still answer your email. Just answer, okay, question answered. Let's move on, right? Um, I think that the expectation that everything we need to do needs to be exactly how it would have been in the building is not only exhausting, but unnecessary. So definitely, it's, as we've been saying throughout this webinar, right? Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries are the most important thing that you can do both for yourself and for your loved ones and so um that's one big thing even even just putting a time from the day to day right you say in the building my hours are nine to five so between the hours of nine to five i'm here as a professional i will answer questions i will 
take meetings, whatever it might be. Uh, anytime after that, I will not be taking, you know, I will not be checking my email. I will not be answering questions. Again, we are blessed enough not to actually be a essential frontline worker, right? So any, like, there are so few cases in which that email can't wait until the next morning at 9 a.m., right? Unless the building is flooding or on fire or, you know, something, in which case, unless you're a manager, that has nothing to do with you, right? You're not getting paid to somehow keep the building from not being on fire. Um, they can wait. Uh, I always try and actually put it in my signature, if I can, to say, uh, won't answer on nights and weekends, so the expectation is there. Um, if you're not able to actually do that, like write it out because of mm, explicit or implicit pushback you might get, just trying your best to not check your email, whether it's deleting the app off your phone, or you know putting it on like do not disturb during certain times um, is definitely a way to continue to have that work-life separation um, in terms of overcoming sort of organizational uh, culture things that might be leading to overwork this is a great time to talk to your other colleagues at the same level and create a union basically even if you're not even if you already have a union i'm not talking about like the actual legal process of creating a union i'm talking about like a collective group right of faculty and staff or whatever it might be and saying hey there's a crisis happening right now what if we all just decide not to continue to do this breakneck pace that we've been doing for the past however many centuries in libraries, right? What if we say, um, as Eamon said before, right, we're not working from home, like we're working at home during a crisis, you know, trying to work. And so what if we all acknowledge that and say that these are the things that we will and won't accept from our administration, from our supervisors. Because if you all do it, then there's no, it's a lot harder to come down uh, from the administration to punish you in any way, right? If it's one or two people, they can always say, oh, well, you know, look at so-and-so, they're answering emails at 2 a.m. Why aren't you answering emails at 2 a.m.? But if you all decide, no, we're, we're actually going to get a full night's sleep. We're actually going to not schedule meetings. I have coworkers who are still trying to be like, oh, I'm available at like 9 p.m. for a meeting if you're not free during the day. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> I'm eating and watching Schitt's Creek. That's what I'm doing. Uh, you know, to make sure that there can be no like sort of one person that they can use to as a bludgeon against everyone else. And if you do have that one person who just is so enthusiastic and about libraries that they want to give every waking moment to it, just acknowledging that it isn't actually professional to spend your whole life in a library, you know, bringing out all the various research that we've talked about throughout this webinar, you know, in terms of the effects on the body, the effects on the psyche, burnout, right? Every single conference at libraries, we, there's at least one or two things about burnout and how to prevent burnout, right? It's like, these are the reasons why we are continuing to have these conversations about burnout is because we're not making organizational changes to prevent burnout. And if you are a manager or an administrator leading by example, you know, saying, 
oh, I'm only available from this time to this time for professional inquiries. Oh, you know, praising those who are um, showing boundaries, um, saying, like giving encouragement to others to have boundaries is one of those ways to overcome the challenges of the sort of elongated day that working from home can often bring. Great, very many important points. Thank you, Fabazi. Uh, Katrina. So, um, I like to start off with some data because I want to give a shout out to Eamon and Fabazi while I have them in my face. So, um, and I and I talk with them, you know, every now and then. Things. So I've been doing a study on the effects of low morale, people who are dealing with low morale now, before COVID, the pandemic started kicking in. So in their regular work before a pandemic, they were dealing with low morale, which again is um, exposure, repeated protracted exposure to workplace abuse and neglect. Um, so I've been doing a study saying if you've already been dealing with low morale before this pandemic and now you and you're still dealing with it right now, of course, I want to hear how your library's response has impacted your low morale. And so one of the questions I ask is, which of the following have you experienced during your low, your library's response to COVID-19? 77% say vocational awe. I mean, sorry, 69% say vocational awe. They have dealt with vocational awe, which in short. Um, is the weaponization of LIS values against people who work in libraries. So using the ideas of service as a mechanism to say you should serve even more. That's when we see things like, you know, oh, I'm doing all the things, mission creep, job creep, and everything that Fabazi hasn't mentioned, people being not, you know, working all times of hours, feeling great about all the service that they're doing. We should feel good about the service that we're doing, but overextending ourselves in the name of our values and the identity that we have as librarians. Um, the other thing I want to share here that Eamon hasn't really mentioned, but it is what he's, I feel like we, he has um, known for his work with resilience narratives, which basically means that people are being held to account when system failures are at play. And so 77% say they have been exposed to resilience narratives during the um, COVID-19 pandemic and their library's responses. I think we need to be aware of that. So when you ask me what are, what are my, um, tools for self-care, knowledge, knowing that those things are being enacted against you in real time during a pandemic. Another thing as a countermeasure to that is, if there are leaders in the room right now, um, please neutralize your, your power in this space right now, because I'm going to give it to you. You need to um, continue, consider really what empathetic leadership means. So that means all of us, leaders and not leaders, need to take a look at are we micromanaging people right now? And this goes to what Fabazi just mentioned about recreating face-to-face -face work expectations. When like Eamon said, we are working during, a, we are living through a pandemic trying to work from home. What you have not seen today while I've been sitting here, because my door is locked and my, I happen to have a spouse who is working at home with me, is my five-year-old little one running amok behind us. What we have not done yet today is his work for school. So I still have that to do today. So there are people working from home who don't have time to work from home, who would love to be able to still help librarians. I too am practice focused. I miss very much all the programs that I'm not doing right now. It's the end of the year and I want my students to know that we are taking care of them and want them to succeed and I cannot be there for them at the same time. That grieves me a great deal that I cannot serve them that way. I'm trying to figure out other ways to serve them. So first of all, I want to share with you that data. You need to know that these things are working against you, whether you know them or not. They have names, vocational awe, resilience narratives. So when we're talking about self-care, you need to be able to name what we're caring against. Um, in addition to literal workplace abuse and neglect. These are the things we're working against. So some of the things I do that are free, I've just realized, noticed this thing called sound baths. So someone was talking about that informed, that trauma informed, and different things you can try. Um, it offers this idea of breathing and distraction without saying you're breathing or distract, without using the words meditation or breathing. 
Um, it's just you listen to sounds that are soothe that hopefully may be soothing to you. And a person does that without talking. Um, I'm going to share some. I'm, I'm Oh, Katrina, I think you got muted on accident. Sorry. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. I just hit enter for the thing. Okay, so um, so sound baths for me are a new thing that I'm, tr I'm trying. And I'm not saying I'm doing it. I'm trying it. The first time I went, I said, I'm just going to try it. So another thing I would say is watch how you talk to yourself during this pandemic. I am constantly talking to myself. One of the things I might, it might be just as simple as a redirect, i.e., I'm not watching that guy talk about bleach today. Or it may be, oh, I should be doing so and so. I quit because so and no, what you should be doing is la la la. Or you don't have to do that right now. As a person, as a woman, I we are constantly thinking about all the things we have to do, at least for me, in my in my body, in my mind. I'm always thinking about all the things I have to do for work. As academics, I don't get to leave my job because my job is in part thinking a lot and not just thinking about, you know, thinking about problems to solve what's going on in academia, how we can make things better, um, those types of things. And because my work is also my praxis and my service of helping other people, I am constantly trying to think of ways to help others, not only as librarians, but as librarians dealing with workplace abuse and neglect. So I'm never, it never really lets up because it's a passion of mine that I also enjoy. Um, but I redirect a lot and I um, try sound bath. That's something that has helped me. I also have tried meditation. I do yoga, but I also say no. I, every day at the end of my day, an automatic reply. When I log into my email, the first thing I do is program it. I send it out. If you get an email, me and like yesterday, I think I forgot, but for the most part, when I wake up in the morning, open my email, the first thing I do is program my automatic reply. For, the, for five o'clock and tomorrow's my birthday and they're gonna get a whole day of nothing from me. I'm not doing anything on my birthday, <laughs> you know, it's not happening and that automatic reply is gonna say, oh, you were here for me on Friday, Thursday, Thursday. So, and another thing is this also came while I was working, a supervisor of mine just asked me if my workers can do something for another department. I need more information. Is it voluntary, is it mandatory? For how long? What do they need? What do they have to do? So not this automatic yes, because some maybe that department, you need to figure out what they're going to do for them. Maybe you need to hire somebody in the meantime during this pandemic. I don't know. But I need more information. So I don't just blanketly say yes to things just because other people need them. Everybody needs something in this pandemic. And this is just, you know, maybe this is an opportunity you for thinking your department, what you need to be advocating for for your department and not coming over to the library because they have nothing to do. This is, I said, this is what they're doing. This is the problems that we're having while we're doing it. If you want them to do it, is it voluntary? What do I need to tell them? So they can make a decision if they have the capacity. The, the question was, do they have, do, do your people have capacity to do so-and-so? I don't speak to other people, but I need more information so they can make a determine and I'll let you know. So these sorts of things, and this goes back to, you just don't give a blanket yes. And this goes back to collective, action, just like Fabazi says. It just takes one person to say, why? Why do we have to do that this way? Can you share with me more information before I make a decision? I need more time. So sometimes a no is, I need more information. And then have them think about it, and then maybe they'll decide. Most of the time, they're like, you know what? Don't worry about it. OK, that's fine. I just need to know why while we're doing that. So advocacy, again, this is how you advocate for people. Advocate for people. Um, so those are some of the things I've been doing. And some of these things I've been doing as a term of for a while, it's just because I just realized that it's really helpful now that this we're in this pandemic, particularly advocating for people. And I wanna end by saying, again, if you're a formal leader, a supervisor, please have empathy because this is what we're expecting of you more than processes. Processes are always going to be in place, but it'd be great if empathy was in, at, taking, taking the precedence. We have values in our profession. What would happen if we didn't weaponize them at this time? Thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Katrina. Amanda. Um, so I've been practicing a lot of silence. Um, 
not really saying anything and not responding right away. So I, I found that in academia, when they're ready to move, they want a response. Well, I might not be ready. I could have been ready a couple of weeks ago when we first talked about this, but now we had to have eight meetings about it. So I've been trying to not respond to anything or to give it a couple of hours before I respond. So sometimes, you know, and sometimes my response is if I do respond, it's I'm not prepared to do that in this moment. I'll get back to you when I'm ready or when I'm available, right? So I think we need to give people the language to um, say, I can't, this is not going to happen today. It may not even happen tomorrow. It may not happen the day after that. It may happen next week and have that be okay. Um, because you're asking people to do quite a lot with very little resources. I know I can speak for myself. Um, they wouldn't even give me a laptop, my institution. How am I supposed to work from home if I don't have a laptop? A tablet, nothing. They wouldn't give us anything. And then they had the nerve to say that because we weren't vital, that we didn't need one. So, you know, I'm not prepared to do, to go above and beyond, you know, for people who can't even see the value of why I would need a laptop um, in my home, right? And you have to think about it that way. I think you have to center, we have to work more on centering ourselves in the conversation. If they can't even see you as a person who needs to work, right, and needs things in order to work well, then why should you be giving all of your energy, attention, and all of this, um, this sort of lock, like lockjawedness that we do for the profession? I think we need to let that go a little bit and realize that we are people first, and we are librarians next. And like um, Jen said, we're living our lives while we're working, right? Work, work is a bonus. Work is something that, that basically, I know we all have to do it because none of us are wealthy here, but we're, we're doing it because we find some enjoyment in it or you wouldn't be here at all. You wouldn't be a librarian then, right? Because what would be the benefits for you then if you didn't quite like it, okay? Again, with the scheduling, every day I have my lunch on. I have my lunch on my schedule probably until next year sometime. And I make sure that that is also on like my, you know, when you can book a, like schedule an appointment or whatever, I make sure it's on that as well. I find that people update one calendar and not the other. So make sure that all of your calendars are the same. I try to make all my calendars, even I have a paper calendar that is like lunch, make sure you take it. Or if I don't take my full lunch, then I leave early. And I, I know some people are like, oh, I can never. You're not getting me for free. Slavery is over. If it if 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 twelve o'clock hits and I don't take lunch, then I best believe like four forty, I'm out of there. That's it. You have to set those hard boundaries. I think not only with your colleagues but with yourself. I think we're so focused on putting those boundaries on other people. Like you need to listen to what I say and you got to do this and you got to do that. But what about you? Where's your part in it to say, I'm not doing this. I'm leaving early because I need to. No explanation. We need to work on that as well. No explanation whatsoever. I'm leaving because I'm an adult and I have to go. That's it. You don't need to tell Johnny, Mary Beth, Mary Kate, Mary Sue, all your business. Go. And I would encourage you to think about that more. You don't, um, my, my MBSR teacher said it really well, people are not entitled to your story. You don't have to have a story around why you meditate. You meditate, that's enough. You don't need to have a story around why you have that boundary. The boundary is there, you enforce it, other people follow it, that's it. We don't need to go through these stories all the time um, because they're ours. There's no need to share. If you want to, that is perfectly fine. But don't feel like you have to tell someone why you have that boundary. That's totally okay. Figure out what you need, like I said earlier, and I think like we, we're all saying throughout this, figure out what you need and how you can achieve it for yourself. You know, make small achievable goals um, is one thing I would definitely say for this time. 
if it's only that you make your bed, if it's like, hey, I'm going to start a sourdough kit, like Eamon said, <laughs> or something maybe that you haven't done in a while. Maybe you used to practice yoga all the time, but now, you know, right before COVID, you couldn't. Maybe try to get back to that a little bit. Figure out what it is that you like to do in this time that you can sort of work on that or do nothing and see how that feels. Where is your comfortability right now? For me, mine is doing yoga every day, right? For you, it may just to be sit in silence for five minutes every day, not necessarily meditating, but just, just sitting there. Find your own comfort zone, and then you can work on everything else. And keep practicing your assertive communication. No, why, how come? That's it. No more, no more stories, no more explanations, no, no need to do a jig. It's okay to say no. It's okay to enforce your boundaries. It's okay to say no to grit, to low morale, um, to vocational awe. Those are all okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. And last but not least, Eamon. Yeah, so I guess I get the final word. Uh, <laughs> No, this has been, everybody has really hit upon like everything that's important here. So I will keep it brief. Um, I mean, so here's my, my simple answer to um, creating work-life balance. Uh, there are three things. One is to fight for better pay and working conditions. Two, refuse work collectively, overwork collectively, not all work. And three, avoid wellness advice that really has that intention of making you a better worker or just to get you to buy things, right? So there is useful wellness advice. There is a whole industry for self-care and wellness that is just meant to get money, right? So be sure to distinguish between those things as well. But really, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, uh, libraries all over have already been seeing these various degrees of underfunding and understaffing. And when those principles like productivity and running a lean organization are prioritized above everything else, like when this crisis hits, we are facing very dire situations for staffing and our well-being because we're already cut to the bone, right? So um, really I want to tie back to that thread um, about advocacy. I think that's kind of the main takeaway here. It means self-advocacy, but also collective advocacy. Um, it doesn't mean taking care of ourselves. I mean, simple things like guarding the time on our calendars, um, prioritizing work projects that you enjoy, um, taking your vacation in sick days, and working to your contract, like Fabazi says. Um, and, you know, also remembering that if you're not engaged in all of your tasks, it's not you, right? It's because life as we knew it two months ago has been completely uprooted. Um, so I guess just to uh, conclude on a more positive note, um, it's just really so important to connect with other people right now, um, not letting that isolation get to you and seeking out kind of colleagues and friends and finding joy in each other's company, I think is a really important place um, to start and to stay. Um, and then from there, you know, building coalitions and taking collective stances uh, whenever it's possible at your workplace, right? So it's not a solitary pursuit. Um, wellness and work-life balance does not happen in a vacuum. So find those people who you can uh, commiserate with and strategize with. Great. Thank you so much, Eamon, and everyone else. Um, I want to again thank our panelists for their time and their um, sharing their expertise with us. Um, wonderful comments from everybody, and I saw a lot of great things happening in the chat box as well. I will be pulling out links that were shared from the chat and including them in the follow-up email. Um, so don't worry, you won't lose those. I'll go ahead and share my screen again really quickly. Oops, if I have my PowerPoint open, I can. Um, and I want to thank everybody who took the time out of their day to be here with us for uh, this webinar. Um, I wanted to go ahead and promote another webinar I'm hosting on Friday. This one will be, um, there, there will be a presentation from the speakers that are talking about how they're providing virtual services um, during this time, and they have um, spent a lot of time building relationships in their community prior to that, and they're going to share that information. 
that link will be in the email I sent out, send out either today or, or tomorrow morning. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the CDC is your best source for information on uh, COVID-19, but in particular to point out this section of the CDC website that a lot of people may not be aware about, aware of. There is a section there on daily life and coping, which includes things uh, about the stress of uh, and the effects of what's happening to us right now. Um, they have some information about caring for children, but um, I am also fond of the animal thing as a, as a dog um, mom. So um, these links will be included in your email as well. If you are not a member of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, please consider joining. I know the name is a little misleading, but we really are for everyone, just not for medical libraries. You can also browse all of our free webinars and classes at nnlm.gov slash training. Oops. If you're looking for continuing education credit, you will receive 1.5 hours for this webinar from the Medical Library Association. You will receive that link from me in an email. Uh, we will also get this recording published to YouTube, usually within a week, and you, everyone who registered for the class will receive that information, um, along with a feedback survey about the information um, and the content that was shared today. Um, that is it for me. I want to thank everyone and our panelists again for your time today. I appreciate you and everything that you're doing. Please take care of yourself. I'm going to end the recording. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.